All right, um, we are starting uh, the content unit of uh, topic three, which is biodiversity and conservation. Um, this unit has four subtopics. The first subtopic is simply an introduction to biodiversity. Um, that's 3.1. 3.2 is called origins of biodiversity, which is basically on evolution, because if you think of um, the, the origin or the, the cause for biodiversity, all the different plants and animals that live on Earth, um, the reason for that is evolution. 3.3 is going to be our depressing unit that is on the um, risks to biodiversity um, and, and the uh, human-caused endangerment to biodiversity. And then 3.4 is a bit more uplifting, and that's on the conservation of biodiversity. So how do we reverse uh, a lot of the things that we did um, or have done as, as humans to uh, species on Earth. Um, as a reminder, uh, when taking notes, uh, if it's written in red, you can just uh, follow along, read, comprehend it. Uh, but if it's in black, um, read it, comprehend it, and then write it down in your own words. Um, if you get in the habit of just mindlessly writing down uh, word by word definitions of what I'm saying, um, it's really not helping you understand the material. And when it comes time for a quiz or a test, you have to basically go back and learn it. Um, but if you're able to pause the video, put things in your own words, um, uh, simplify things and really understand it as you're going, then you're basically um, uh, killing two birds with one stone. Well, let's not kill birds because it's conservation. So you are um, uh, doing two things at once because you are completing the notes, which is the assignment, but then you're also studying. Um, and then as always, if you have questions or confusions, please write little notes in the margin, um, highlight parts of your notes. But, um, you know, when we come back in school and um, recap, I would, I would like to discuss this. I know if these notes were in person, there'd probably be lots of questions throughout and um, discussion. And so you need to try your best to try to um, uh, continue that like it is a live lecture. You just need to jot down your question, your, your wondering, whatever it is, and then save it until the next class. Okay, so uh, let's start with the term biodiversity. Let's break this down. We know what bio means, bio meaning life. Um, diversity, you should know what that means. Diversity means differences. Um, so we're looking at the differences of living things. Um, scientifically, we define it as a measure of biological richness of a specific area, including species, habitat, and genetic diversity. We could simplify this as it's the amount of living diversity. Um, and the IB is pretty specific about this definition, per unit area. Anytime we're measuring biodiversity, whether it's species diversity, genetic diversity, habitat diversity, um, the IB wants us to include the, the term per unit area. A unit could be anything. You can measure the biodiversity uh, within one square meter of soil. You can measure the biodiversity of a single coral reef or of the country of Ecuador, and those would all be different unit areas. But um, we're always looking at biodiversity within some sort of area, some unit area. Um, globally, how many species are there? Take a guess, say it out loud. Good, got it, uh, two million. Um, however, two million is a bit of an asterisk because there's two million cataloged species, meaning there's two million species that have been identified and they've been named and they are officially here on planet Earth. Yet, there's probably at least 10 million out there. Um, now, scientists disagree on how many exactly, but for an example, if you go to a part of the rainforest um, and cut down a tree in the middle of the rainforest, and then you take samples of all of the mosses and algae and lichens that live on the tree, the different insects and fungus that live um, on the bark, um, the, the microscopic uh, bacteria that live in the leaves, that one individual tree might yield to 50 species that we never knew about. Now, again, a lot of these species are not big mammals or beautiful birds that are undiscovered. That stuff happens um, uh, from time to time we discover a new mammal or a new bird species. Um, but when you think about the less known organisms, um, even something like pick up a handful of soil on a farm in Nebraska, and there might be five species of protozoans, which is a type of like protist that's never been cataloged before. So again, it's very likely that there's over 10 million. Some scientists think there's more like 100 million. If you count 
you know, if you think about the depths of the ocean, the, the deepest part of the rainforest that haven't been um, uh, uh, measured ecologically, um, th there could be a hundred million or more species out there. Um, some scientists say, no, it's probably more like four or five million. We've probably cataloged half of them, but the average guess is probably around 10 million species that we don't know about. Um, I sort of led to this question, but what types of organisms are mostly undiscovered? It's the things, uh, the small things, the invertebrates, the microscopic organisms. Um, and then lastly, what biomes are most undiscovered organisms probably found in? Say rainforest, because it's already our most biodiverse ecosystem, similar with coral reefs. Um, and then beyond that, uh, the depths of the ocean. Um, it's sort of it's not very uh, habitable because there's not much sunlight. There's not a lot of food down there, except when like a whale dies and the, the body decomposes and sinks to the bottom of the ocean. But um, any species that are living at the very bottom of the ocean are mostly undiscovered. Um, if we look at the, the proportion of biodiversity species, most of our um, species are insects. Um, I think even beetles alone make up like almost a quarter of the world's species. Um, if you look at like Mammals, oh, we don't even have mammals on this list. We have chordates, which are um, anything with a backbone, fish, uh, mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, um, all those species, all the things that we think about as like animals is just a really small sliver of the total pie of biodiversity. Again, the vast majority being insects, things like uh, nematodes, which are worms, arachnids, which are spiders, algae, fungus. Um, we have virus on this list. I'm not sure if that's totally accurate because viruses are not always considered to be living things. So I'm not sure if, if um, the new virus discovered last year, COVID-19. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about it, um, but look it up. COVID-19 was pretty interesting. It was um, originated in a, a uh, bat species in China, um, made its way to the U.S. Um, it, it definitely caused some impacts globally. Just read a cool article from the New York Times about COVID-19. Consider the virus's point of view. Um, and it is, uh, it's pretty interesting. It's about the, the COVID-19 from the virus's point of view. Again, if you haven't heard of COVID-19, um, look that up. It's, it's pretty interesting. Definitely a current issue. A uh, quick example, uh, a couple examples of the newest uh, mammal species. It's a big mammal that lives in trees in Colombia, and we literally didn't know it existed until a few years ago. So it's pretty amazing to think that there's like big animals out there that, that literally have never been photographed, have never been cataloged. Um, we don't know they exist. Uh, it's pretty amazing to think about. Um, even just looking at last year, um, I did a quick Google search, 71 species discovered. Again, most of these are not big, large, exciting mammals like the Olinguito, but things like fish, uh, 15 geckos were discovered last year, sea slugs, uh, arachnids, eels, uh, skates. This is a skate that I have a picture of. It's, it's similar to like a ray. It's in the shark family. Um, so again, just last year, 70 species discovered, millions more out there that we don't know about. All right, um, getting back to the, the content of diversity. There's three types of biodiversity that I prefaced um, in our, our definition. The first type is the most common. So I'd say 90% of the time when, when an ecologist mentions biodiversity, they're talking about species diversity. And species diversity is just that. It's the diversity or the, um, the measurement of the number of species, the distribution of species, and then the key word, uh, the evenness of species, which we often forget about. And then, of course, as I mentioned, uh, this is all per unit area. So per one hectare of forest. A hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. Or per um, a square mile of um, prairie or whatever that unit area might be. Um, okay, take a look at this diagram. Um, up top, we see a community with four species of tree. Down below, we see a community with four species of tree. Which one of these is more biodiverse? Uh, the top one, the bottom one, or are they even or equal? All right, the correct answer is the top one. And the reason is that comes down to evenness, okay? So even though that they, they are 
Um, mathematically, they each have four species there. Um, if you look at the definition, it's not just the number of species, but it's the evenness of species. Um, think about, a, think about um, we, we often think about diversity in terms of like race issues. So if we consider a school to be diverse, it's because there's a lot of different um, races or, or ethnicities at the school. So if there's a school that is 25% um, white, 25% black, 25% Latino, 25% Asian, um, and I apologize, you know, I'm, I'm leaving out other races and ethnicities. Um, that school would be fairly evenly um, distributed between those four races, whereas let's say another school was 90% um, uh, white, 5% black, 3% Latino, 2% Asian. Um, again, even though, all, even though both schools um, are represented by this, the same uh, amount of, of differences, you would consider that first school to be more diverse uh, because of the evenness, if that, if that is helpful. That was offensive in any way, I apologize. All right, let's talk about evenness and richness. Um, richness is the total number of species per sample. So again, those two schools that I just mentioned, which one has more racial richness? You would say they're the same because they're both represented by four different racial groups. Or a better example, that, that last diagram, um, both forests are evenly rich because they're both, um, uh, they both have four species. If we look at evenness, though, it's the measure of relative abundance of the different species. And so that's where that top drawing would be a little bit more even, therefore more biodiverse. Um, the reason why we care about evenness is because a single dominant species um, really makes a, a ecosystem or a biome less healthy um, because a single dominant species can crowd out uh, other species. Um, if there's a disease or some factor that led to the demise of that one species, it could throw the, uh, the whole ecosystem into turmoil, where if there's an ecosystem with an even distribution of species and one species is, um, uh, goes extinct or uh, is wiped out for some reason, then it would not have as big of an effect of an eco on the ecosystem. So you would consider the ecosystem that's more even to be healthy. Next type of diversity is genetic diversity. And this is the, within a, a species, within a population, this is the range of genetic differences. Um, a high level of genetic diversity means the population is stable and healthy, whereas a low level of genetic diversity, we would say that population is at risk um, due to disease, due to inbreeding. Hopefully you remember some of this stuff from biology, um, where if, uh, let's say, the human population uh, had very low genetic diversity and we all had an allergy to the exact same food, and then for whatever reason that food was highly available and other foods were unavailable, our species would be at very high risk because we have this, this deadly allergy that could wipe out the whole group. But because um, we're very diverse, some of us are allergic to milk, some of us are allergic to eggs, some of us are allergic to peanuts, some of us are allergic to bee stings. Um, if one of these things happens, it might affect our population, but it won't cause extinction of the species. Um, same thing with inbreeding. If we're, if we're too similar, then when we breed, there are um, genetic threats. Um, Cheetahs are an example of low genetic diversity. There's a bottleneck effect that occurred about 60,000 years ago during the Little Ice Age. Was that the Big Ice Age? I think it was the Big Ice Age, the Pleistocene. Um, the, the Ice Age, uh, which affected Africa, um, almost caused the extinction of cheetahs. And a lot of species did go extinct at this time, but cheetahs did not go extinct. Um, they almost went extinct, and then they recovered. However, if you notice the shape of this curve, when they get to that, that bottom out point, and then the whole species rebounds back from, I don't know, maybe there was uh, uh, 1,000 left at one point, 1,000 cheetahs have repopulated, and now there's, there's maybe 50,000 cheetahs, but they're all um, basically sort of related. So cheetahs um, really struggle with genetic diversity. Um, there's a lot of data that shows the cheetah may go extinct, not because of human interaction like other species, but because they're basically inbred. They all have very similar um, genetic deficiencies and genetic diseases because most cheetahs are 
breeding with distant cousins from each other that have very similar genetics. Okay, and then the last type of biodiversity is habitat diversity. Should be pretty obvious. This is the diversity or the range of different habitats per unit area in an ecosystem or biome. Um, a more simplified version of this, if you remember the term niche, a niche is like an organism's specific um, role or the, the place that an organism can survive, both physical space and sort of like metaphorical, the role that they consume in the ecosystem. Um, how, many, how many niches are available in the, in the area? Um, so an area with more habitat diversity would have more available niches. Um, a good example would be a farm, a monoculture farm where we're just growing corn. That would have very few niches, therefore it would have very low habitat diversity. Um, caveat for habitat diversity. If I ever ask you what type of diversity is most important or what type of diversity should we spend our dollars conserving, habitat diversity is sort of the umbrella answer because if you save habitat diversity, you are then by definition, if you're protecting the habitat, it means you're protecting the species in there and you're also protecting the genetics within the species, within that population. Um, uh, again, just think back to topic two, the different, um, the different types of habitats, the different biomes. Um, the more biomes or the more differences within a biome um, would be the higher the habitat diversity of an area. Um, example of habitat diversity. So uh, tundra has fairly low habitat diversity. Um, if you protected 50 to 200 hectares of tundra, you would probably protect all the species in the region because if you took one sample of tundra, because tundra has low habitat diversity, if you can save one section of it, you're pretty much saving at least one of everything that, that lives there, um, or hopefully two of everything. Um, tropical forest has really, really high habitat diversity. Um, if you protected 50 to 200 hectares of tropical forest um, and lost the rest, you would lose a lot of species, a lot of genetics, because um, within the ecosystem of tropical forest, there's so many small different niches. Um, there's combinations of a specific parasitic plant that lives on a specific tree and a leaf cutter ant that only eats the parasitic plant that lives on the tree. And so if you lose that one tree, you could literally be wiping out several species. Um, rainforest is, is truly incredible, the diversity of a rainforest, that within one a small unit area of the rainforest, um, especially thinking about things like um, microscopic creatures, insects, um, the, the amount of species is, is astronomical. Okay, um, now when it comes to measuring or cataloging biodiversity, there's three different levels. What are these levels? Give you a hint, they're pretty obvious. If you have been paying attention throughout the first 15 minutes, you should be able to understand that we're gonna be looking at habitat diversity or ecosystem diversity. We're gonna be looking at species diversity, and then lastly, genetic diversity. So again, an ecologist studying biodiversity, this could happen at one of three levels. You could be studying the diversity of ecosystems, um, you could be studying the diversity of species, or you could be studying the genetic diversity within a population within a species. Um, important to note that genetic diversity, oh, look at that technology, Mr. Carden, nice job. Genetic diversity isn't just looking at the genetics within the species, but the populations within a species, because remember, um, back from, all right, no more technology. Uh, back from topic two, if there's a population of cheetahs that live here, and there's a population of cheetahs that live here, um, but there's a barrier, there's a, a fence or a road or something separating them, um, realize that these cheetahs are not breeding with those cheetahs. Um, so the genetic diversity here is, is, is not intermingling. Um, this would be two separate populations, so it would make sense to study the genetics uh, separately. Um, beyond the three levels, um, biodiversity can be assessed locally, regionally, or globally. Um, so we can look at metadata of what's the biodiversity of birds across the world, um, or we could look at local data. How many species of migratory birds fly through Macomb County uh, every September when they're heading down to the tropics or every May when they're heading up to Canada.
Okay, the importance of biodiversity. So, you know, besides the fact that it's really cool that our, our planet has millions of species on it and these species all have their own, you know, uh, individual rights uh, to be here. Why, why does this stuff matter? So, um, first of all, in terms of a scientific principle, biodiversity is often an indicator of ecosystem health and importance. Ecosystems with higher biodiversity are generally healthier. Um, they they uh, lead to more ecological services, so they're generally worth more than other ecosystems. And again, that idea of worth could mean a few things. It could be worth more in terms of money, in terms of aesthetics, in terms of intrinsic value. Um, Biodiversity is an insurance policy against change. So diversity often leads to stability and resilience. So again, um, a forest with only that's dominated by one single species of tree, if that tree goes extinct for whatever reason, because of climate change, because of a fungal disease, because of logging, um, then that whole ecosystem um, is destroyed. But if there's a forest with 12 types of trees and a few of them go extinct, um, it's, that ecosystem is going to be resilient. It's going to be able to absorb that change and continue functioning as a, a healthy ecosystem. Um, maybe the term dynamic equilibrium rings a bell. Um, a, a less diverse ecosystem would be um, uh, instable equilibrium. That's not the right word. Um, Oh man, I'm blanking on my 1.2 terminology. Hopefully someone can remind me next class. But uh, a, a dynamic equilibrium would be uh, a balance that gets altered, but because of the resilience of the ecosystem, it's going to be able to come back to where it uh, originally was. Um, number three, it's the source of all natural capital for human use. Uh, that's right, all natural capital, 100% of the natural capital on planet Earth is due to biodiversity. Um, whether it's things like uh, food or goods or medicine, um, recreation, um, think about lakes and rivers and hiking and all the value we get uh, from, from nature. Uh, and then lastly, if we look at the holistic viewpoint, um, biodiversity takes millions of years to occur. Um, so I could say billions. Earth, Earth started uh, 4.5 billion years ago, the first living thing was 3.5 billion years ago. So 3.5 billion year process to create the Olenguito um, and humans and um, uh, the species that we have today. They're, they're literally the, not the end result, but the continually progressing result of evolution. And so, you know, it's fairly valuable. And when we lose a species forever and ever, um, that obviously is holistically important. Um, okay. Eight ecological services of biodiversity. Uh, pause the video and try to brainstorm here. See how many you can remember um, in terms of just an ecological service, meaning, remember, uh, goods or resources or natural capital, that's stuff we take from nature. Ecological service are almost like things that are given to us by nature. So take a moment to pause the video and try to make the list. All right. Um, Photosynthesis is an ecological service uh, provided from biodiversity. All the energy in the biosphere because of photosynthesis due to algae and plants. All the flows of materials, uh, nutrient cycling, pollination, medicine. Hello, staff. Don't forget to come to the Medicine could be argued as a resource potentially, um, whether we're actually taking that from nature or it's being given to us. So that one might be a little bit debatable. Uh, soil, think about the importance of soil. We often treat soil like dirt, but soil is incredibly important. The formation and maintenance of soil is due to biodiversity. Moderation of weather extremes, um, often things like swamps um, or buffer zones or coastal regions can slow down a hurricane or a tidal wave um, they can um, provide backup water during a drought. And so a lot of weather extremes would be worse than what they are if it wasn't for biodiversity. Um, and then last but not least, obviously important, purification of air and water. That's only seven. So that's not last but not least. Last but not least, carbon absorption. Um, without uh, plants absorbing carbon, um, our planet would be way hotter and way less habitable than it is now. 
couple examples of stuff we get from biodiversity, um, whether it's food or fuel or ecosystems or species in general, fiber, lumber, paper. Um, most of our antibiotics and in almost half of medicines. Uh, the Pacific U uh, is where we get Taxol, which is a cancer drug. Um, and then something we've been using for thousands of years, the willow tree. The bark of a willow tree is where we get um, aspirin from. In terms of the importance of biodiversity towards the economy, um, this is an interesting uh, topic and we'll watch this clip as a class. Okay, um, now looking at biodiversity on more of a global scale. Uh, here are the 20 most biodiversity, biodiverse countries in the world. Uh, pause the video and brainstorm these two questions. Number one, what do these countries have in common? Number two, why is this a problem? Okay, so the answer to number one, um, there's a few answers. Like one of them could be that they're mostly near the equator, and we'll talk about reasons for that. But something else you might notice that they're mostly middle to low income countries. Um, there's a few exceptions here, China, India, Australia, Brazil, Mexico. So you got five countries there that are um, not really low income. They're maybe like middle income, but it's definitely not the richest countries in the world. We see the United States is missing from the list. All of Europe is missing from the list. Some of the wealthy countries in the Middle East are, are missing from the list. So generally speaking, we have countries without a lot of money. Um, and why is this a problem? Well, uh, it costs money to, to protect species. Um, for someone to buy land and say, we're protecting this land and keeping all these species safe, it might be easy to do uh, in a country with a lot of resources and money, but in a country in equatorial South Africa or South America or equatorial Africa might be pretty tough to, to spend time and resources protecting species um, when people in these countries are really, really struggling. And although people might benefit long term through the protection of species, it's kind of hard to think long term, again, when, um, when people don't have food on the table or, or don't have uh, the resources for, for a job or for their own capital. Okay, so these species or these uh, countries um, are generally considered biodiversity hotspots. Um, so if you think about the term hotspot, um, hotspot means importance. So they're basically biodiversity important sites. They're the regions on earth with both the highest biodiversity and risk of extinction. So basically they are our most valuable places on earth, ecologically speaking. Um, if you notice the map, why isn't Michigan a hotspot? Michigan is beautiful. Michigan has awesome nature. But guess what? The nature in Michigan is pretty similar to the nature in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Ohio, Ontario, Pennsylvania. And so because of that, it's not super valuable. But notice um, Madagascar, that big island off the coast of Africa. The entire island of Madagascar is a hotspot because there's nothing in the world like Madagascar. Um, most of the species that live on Madagascar, like the 20 species of lemurs, they're not found anywhere else on Earth. Um, most of the species in Michigan, white-tailed deer, coyotes, robins, blue jays, cardinals, uh, blue spruce pine tree, those species are all pretty much found in the Midwest of North America. And so if Michigan disappeared one day, we probably wouldn't lose too many species. But if Madagascar disappeared one day, um, we would lose uh, uh, thousands and thousands of species. Um, so again, these are the areas on Earth that are uh, both most valuable in terms of biodiversity and often at um, really high risk of extinction. Um, so bio hotspots are often rich in endemic species. And you do need to know what this term endemic means. Endemic means they're found nowhere else in the world. So realize it's a little bit different than native. You guys know the difference between native and invasive. Um, a native species means it's naturally found there. An invasive species means that it was brought there by humans and it's um, invading, causing problems to the area. But endemic is like one level beyond native. So um, our uh, bald eagles native to Michigan? Yes, they are. They're naturally found here. Are bald eagles endemic to Michigan? No, because bald eagles live in Canada and 
Pennsylvania and Ohio and throughout most of North America. Are lemurs native to Madagascar? Yes. Are they endemic to Madagascar? Yes, they are, because lemurs are only found in Madagascar. They're found nowhere else on Earth. Um, so again, bio hotspots are places that are in need of emergency conservation. If we were able to raise money and, and say, okay, we need to protect the most important areas on the planet, we would want to protect those hotspots. And it's been years of diligent research by scientists to determine what those different bio hotspots are. Um, generally speaking, there's about 34 hotspots on planet Earth, and they only make up about 2.5% of the Earth. Um, so 97.5% of the Earth is not a hotspot. Yet, over 60% of our terrestrial biodiversity is found in hotspots, meaning those really important areas, like those spots in Brazil and southern China and Madagascar. Um, and you might notice California is a hotspot because there's some really, really unique species that are only found in California. Um, most of our species on planet Earth are actually found in these hotspots. Um, it's kind of a crazy stat, but maybe it's a little bit uplifting that we can say, hey, we don't need to protect the entire planet to save species from going extinct. If we concentrate our resources towards these hotspots, we can still save a lot of um, these endemic or, or endangered species. Um, we'll talk about this back in class, but a billion people live in biodiversity hotspots. Um, this is a problem which I mentioned, but it's also a potential solution. Um, so I'm gonna call on a couple of you uh, randomly in next class. Um, so discuss or think about, brainstorm, jot down an answer. Why is it, we know it's a problem that, um, that hotspots are being shared between nature and people in mostly LEDCs, but how is that a potential solution? So try to think of a, a answer before. Um, again, another example of uh, these are our biodiversity hotspots for birds, and we notice that they're mostly near the equator. Um, why do you think that is? What's at the equator that um, might not be other places? All right, more sunlight, more energy. Because there's more sunlight, more energy, more primary productivity, that simply means that there's more available resources to go around. There's another, there's another reason for this, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Um, why do you think intermediate disturbances would lead to higher diversity? Um, so why do you think that a place with no, diver, no disturbance, when I say disturbance, I mean forest fire, flood, hurricane, why would a place with no disturbance have lower biodiversity? Why would a place with really, really high rates of disturbance have lower biodiversity? And why would it be that a place with a medium amount of disturbances would actually have the highest biodiversity? Um, again, I'll pose this question to you now and I will call on a couple of you next class. So I'm gonna skip over the next slide. Okay, uh, moving into topic 3.2, origins of biodiversity. Um, and this is the IB's fancy way of saying this topic is on evolution. Because if we think about it, What's the 3.5 billion year old process that leads to all this unique millions of species of biodiversity? It would be Darwin's theory of evolution. Um, remember guys, in case there's any evolution deniers out there who say, well, evolution is just a theory. Remember, scientific theory is an explanation that has been so strongly supported, it is very unlikely to be altered by new evidence, such as the theory of heliocentrism, which is the theory uh, that the Earth rotates around the sun. Um, is that likely to be proven false anytime soon? No. Gravitational theory. Um, different from a law. The law of gravity explains what gravity is. The theory of gravity describes why gravity behaves the way it does. Okay, so to learn about evolution, we need to understand the um, founder of evolution, the discoverer of evolution, who is Darwin. Darwin back in the 1800s, went on a five-year trip around the world. He left from England, went west around South America, um, stopped at the Galapagos Islands, uh, kept going west all the way around the earth, went back to South America, back to England. He collected animals and plants from almost everywhere that he went. So five-year trip, he, he grabbed everything that he could nature-wise to learn about it. Um, and his most important stop was by far the Galapagos Islands. 
the Galapagos Islands we see, there's about 14 different islands. If you look at the shapes of the islands, they all have these little like um, craters in the middle that tells us that they're from volcanic um, islands. But anyways, he, he found that the species on the Galapagos live nowhere else. They are mostly, what's that word? Endemic um, to the Galapagos. Yet, they weren't totally unique. They mostly looked similar to the species that lived in South America. So his hypothesis was that the islands were colonized by plants and animals that came from the mainland. If it was a plant, maybe a tree in South America dropped its seed in the ocean. That seed um, went west 600 miles and um, ended up growing in the soil on the Galapagos. Uh, if it was a, a bird, maybe it... Um, got lost when migrating and went west instead of north, or maybe it got caught up in a storm and got blown over to the island. Um, and then he assumed once they got to the island, based on the environment of the island, they may have changed over time or evolved. Um, most of the species on the Galapagos are endemic. They're found nowhere else in the world, whether it's the blue-footed booby, the marine iguana, or the Galapagos tortoise. These islands are geologically fairly new. Most of them are a few million years old. Um, and again, things on Earth have been living and, and, and uh, land masses have been around for billions of years. Um, but and here's a picture of a brand new island, an underground underwater volcano explodes. Uh, the magma hardens, solidifies into rock, and now you have a brand new island that didn't exist uh, you know, two days before this picture was taken. But um, the fact that the Galapagos Islands are newer, it almost gave uh, Darwin like a, a controlled environment of, of seeing evolution as it's taking place, where oftentimes we have land masses that are so old, we're seeing the results of billions of years of evolution, where um, the Galapagos was millions of years of evolution. Um, over time, uh, these islands go through succession, uh, primary succession from uh, lava, uh, soil builds up over time. Um, those pioneer species like mosses and algae and lichen, um, they die, they decompose. That leads to more soil buildup, and then we can have larger species to eventually a climax ecosystem. Um, and the most important, most important species that Darwin uh, studied were the finches. Um, he noticed that on the Galapagos finches, they pretty much look just like the South American finches, except for one difference. Their beak looked different. Their beak often varied in shape and size. Um, so they must have migrated over and then evolved based on needs for survival, which is basically natural selection. Um, we see here with this uh, evolutionary tree, the common ancestor from South America, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I believe there's about 14 islands in the Galapagos, 14 uh, large islands, and we see 14 different species of finch. Um, basically what happened, and this made it really e kind of easier to, to understand, this species from South America um, migrated over, populated all the islands, but all the islands are a little bit different. Some islands are drier and have cacti. Uh, others maybe a little rainier and have tall trees. Some may have insects available to eat in the ground. Others have insects available to eat um, up high. Some of them might have trees that have edible fruits. And so based on basically survival of finding enough food, um, the finches with slightly different variation from each other in beak size were more or less successful based on the type of beak that they had and the specific island that they ended up. And then fast forward this process of the finches with the good beak to survive, then got enough food to not starve to death and then reproduced and passed on the genetics to have that successful beak. Um, and that happened enough and enough to that we end up with 14 unique species of, of finches that are no longer the same original finch, meaning that one original fish, finch, speciated um, into basically a different species on each island. Uh, he wrote a book on this called The Origin of Species. It explains everything. Uh, it, it explains evolution as um, 
life's unity, the fact that we're all so similar in terms of we all use DNA uh, to, to replicate. It's our genetic information. Um, cellular structure is basically the same in all living things. Um, but also it also just describes the diversity, the fact that there's 14 species of finch that all live in neighboring islands, but they're all different from each other. Uh, it explains natural selection as the cause of evolution. Okay, so uh, some terminologies for evolution vocab. The first one, um, natural selection. Organisms that are well suited to their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. I think of natural selection as the process. And then please note that without genetic variation within a species, natural selection would not occur. Let's go back to those finches. Let's say um, 50 individual finches uh, blew over in a storm from South America to the Galapagos a million years ago. And that's probably likely what happened. But let's say that those finches were all really, really similar to each other. They probably would have died out on 13 of the islands and whatever island that they were well suited for, they would survive. And now we would have one species of finch that lived on one island in the Galapagos. But since there's genetic diversity within populations of species, the fact that we're all slightly different heights, we're all slightly different um, skin color, we're all slightly different um, uh, athletic abilities, we're all very varied from each other genetically, Wild species are the same way. So the fact that these finches are all a little bit different meant that certain traits led to more or less success. And those certain traits led to success, which led to survival, which led to passing on those same similar traits. And that happens long enough time. And we get some species that diverged to having really small beaks for picking up seeds. Other species that got really large beaks for cracking fruit or nuts. Um, there's even the the woodpecker finch, which evolved a behavioral adaptation to drill a hole in a tree, grab a stick, put the stick in the hole with their beak and pull out the insects on the stick. Um, so that's a combination of a beak that can drill a hole into a cactus and the behavioral adaptation to learn, whether it's by chance or, or uh, ingenuity, to, to put a stick in a tree and get the insects out. Okay, and then if natural selection is a process, the result is evolution. Um, evolution is, okay, what happens because of natural selection, and that's the, the change in species over time. So the natural selection was the finches that were well suited to different islands had a better chance to survive and pass on their unique genetics versus those that were not well suited. And then what did that do? That caused 14 different species to end up on these different islands, and they're all a little bit different. From Okay, a little bit more vocab um, for evolution. Fitness. Uh, fitness, re um, fitness refers to reproductive success. Um, generally speaking, how many offspring uh, you will have. So um, I hate to say it, but none of you guys are fit. Um, I fit. I'm fit because I've uh, passed on my genetics twice, so I'm reproductively successful. Um, Mr. Jones is more fit than I am even though I think I could beat Mr. Jones in a race, um, he's fitter than I am. He's passed on his uh, genetics three times. I've only passed on my genetics twice. Um, therefore, he has higher fitness than I do. Okay, next uh, term, species. A group of organisms that breed with each other and produce fertile offspring. Key word there, produce fertile offspring. Um, there are species out there that... Um, may mate, but if they don't produce the same species, like you guys all know, a lion and a tiger make a liger. But lions and tigers are not the same species because ligers are sterile. Um, therefore, they don't meet the definition of species. Okay, um, and then to sort of wrap up the, the first part of this unit, which is just on, okay, what is evolution? What's the origin of all this? Let's try to summarize it in four steps. Just listen first and then try your best to put it in your own words. Step one, within a population of one species, there is genetic diversity, also known as variation. Step two, due to natural variation, due to that genetic diversity, some individuals are fitter than others, meaning some individuals are going to reproduce more and other individuals are going to reproduce less, and that generally deals with survival. 
because out in the wild, if you survive long enough, you're probably going to reproduce. And if you can't survive long enough, you're probably not going to reproduce. Those fitter individuals this is sort of um, obvious, but those fitter individuals are going to reproduce more successfully. Then last but not least, the offspring of fitter individuals will likely inherit the genes for that advantage, and then they will also be fit, meaning they will also be likely to survive and reproduce. Um, we often talk about survival of the fittest, but that's actually inaccurate because survival is pretty worthless if you don't reproduce. Evolutionarily speaking, if you survive and live to be 120 years old, but you never have any kids, um, your evolutionary value is zero. Um, without passing on those genetics, you, you really don't add to the potential evolution of a species. Okay, uh, pause the video uh, and try your best to put these steps in your own words and simplify them. We're going to skip this uh, and do this as a bell ringer. Okay, quick outfit change, uh, but let's keep going. Everything I've talked about with evolution thus far has been mostly review from freshman year, um, but here's some new information um, specific to biodiversity, or specific to this biodiversity unit. It's the idea that speciation is often caused from isolation, and isolation can be different things. We often think of isolation as geographical isolation, like the picture on the right. There's a river that divides the two species, or the, the one species of beetle, and then that beetle uh, le turns into a, a different species over natural selection. But speciation can also be through behavioral Spe uh, isolation, like there might be a mating dance that a, that a male bird does that does not attract a female bird, and that would be a behavioral isolation. Um, genetic isolation, um, as I mentioned before, uh, lions and tigers can mate, but genetically they don't produce fertile offspring. Um, and then things as simple as reproductive isolation, similar to that, where just a zygote doesn't form when sperm and egg meet. Um, the thing that's important is that isolation, whether it is physical, like uh, a species is on an island um, separated by ocean, like in the Galapagos, or whether it's behavioral or anything else, um, isolation leads to evolution. Because isolation, being in your own environment with your own specific natural selection factors, are going to um, be different from other areas, and those differences are going to lead to different selection pressures, different things that are allowing um, certain traits to be successful, leading to reproduction, leading to those traits being passed on to future generations. Um, here's a great example of isolation causing speciation. Two species of um, rodents were naturally found in Arizona millions of years ago. There was a species of chipmunk and a species of squirrel. And then the Grand Canyon formed um, a, a river uh, caused a crack, and that crack got bigger and bigger to eventually this uh, monumental landmark um, known as the Grand Canyon. Um, these rodents can't get across the Grand Canyon, so the chipmunk on the north side of the rim and the south side of the rim ended up being a little bit different because there's slight environmental differences between the north side and the south side. Same thing happened with the squirrel, and this isolation caused two species of rodent to radiate or speciate into four species of rodent. Um, they're now so different that if, um, let's say the Grand Canyon closed, um, which is po possible, um, you know, valleys form, mountains form, um, the, the plates of the earth do shift and change directions. Um, these species are now so genetically different that they wouldn't be able to mate with each other. They might not even be attracted to each other uh, behaviorally. Another example, we got the Eastern Bluebird and the Western Bluebird. Why are they two different species? Well, Colorado Rockies are running right down the middle of that, um, that, that change in species. And so eastern bluebirds can't fly over the Rockies and get out west. The western bluebirds can't fly east of the Rockies. And so they've speciated into two different groups. Um, leopards and lions uh, can mate and create a lepin, but a lepin is not um, uh, reproductively um, uh, fertile. It, it can't reproduce on its own. Therefore, these are different species. And in the wild, a, a lion and leopard are not attracted to each other. They would never choose to mate. Uh, we already talked about this. Um, kind of interesting, but a male lion and female tiger makes a liger, but um, 
What most people don't know about is that a male tiger and female lion makes a tigon. Um, here's a more realistic example. So again, ligers don't exist in the wild, but uh, koi wolves do exist in the wild. In um, Canada, like Quebec area around Montreal, um, there's these creatures known as koi wolves. Um, they, they're, they're kind of big like wolves, but they're not really shy. Um, like wolves, they're kind of more like used to humans like coyotes. Um, they are a hybrid between coyotes and wolves. Now what's interesting is that koi wolves can reproduce. Um, so this brings up two possible questions. Um, the fact that koi wolves can reproduce, does this mean that coyotes and wolves are actually the same species because they can mate in the wild and reproduce? Um, so maybe coyotes are just small wolves or wolves are just big coyotes and they're actually the same animal. Um, or does it mean that koi wolves are its own species? And there's actually three species. There's coyotes, wolves, and koi wolves. Um, what's interesting is that in the world of evolutionary biology, scientists often get categorized as splitters or lumpers. Um, some evolutionary biologists feel strongly that, um, you know what, since wolves and coyotes do mate in the wild and make koi wolves and koi wolves are fertile, um, these are all one species and those evolutionary biologists would be considered lumpers. Um, others would say, no, wolves and, and coyotes are different. Their genetics are different. They're a different species. It doesn't matter if they're making this koi wolf, um, they're all different, meaning the koi wolf is a third species and those biologists would be known as splitters. Um, if anyone's if anyone cares, I'm more of a lumper than a splitter myself. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, koi wolves, um, kind of dangerous. A couple of people have died from koi wolves, uh, a couple joggers in Quebec, because again, they're they're big and tough like wolves. Um, coyotes are pretty small, but um, they have the physical traits of a wolf, but they're also not scared of people like coyotes. Um, and scientists predict that koi wolves are sort of growing in population and they will make it to the Midwest of uh, the US in the next like 30 or 40 years. So um, in terms of stuff to worry about, you can add one more to the list. Uh, koi wolves are coming to Michigan in the next few decades. Another cool example, the wolfin, a false killer whale and an Atlantic bottlenose dolphin um, mate in the wild once in a while and they create a wolfin. And so scientists have discovered wolfins off the coast of New Jersey, New York and the um, Atlantic Ocean. Again, does this mean false killer whales and bottlenose dolphins are the same species or the different species. This goes back to the idea that species is a fluid term. It's a it's a man-made term um, and, and there's no clear right or wrong answer. I think those of you that took Lambda last year in bio probably talked this a bit. Okay, back to just evolution in general. A couple of things that confuse people, so I want to make sure you don't you know ever write down these misconceptions on a quiz or test. Um, number one, individuals don't evolve. Populations do. For example, um, giraffes have long necks not because giraffes that couldn't reach the leaves, like that individual giraffe that couldn't reach the leaf was able to like stretch and grow its neck to reach the leaves. No, the individual giraffe that couldn't reach the leaves died because it couldn't get food and then it never reproduced. And the giraffe that happened to have the longer neck could reach the leaves and reproduced because it was able to survive and passed on its genes to have longer necks. And then over millions of years of generation, you have this strange looking creature called the giraffe that has really, really long necks. But no individual giraffe ever like got a longer neck through evolution. It's about survival of those with the better traits, passing on those traits. Um, those traits get passed on enough. Long neck giraffe, long neck giraffe, have a baby, that baby has an even longer neck. And then um, that baby survives and reproduce and finds another long necked mate to reproduce with. Evolution is not intentional or purposeful, okay? There's no, like, goal of evolution. It's really, it, it all comes down to randomness. Uh, and lastly, natural selection is situational. Uh, environments can vary and change. Um, polar bears uh, in Michigan would not be a good trait because it's, it's too warm. And having white fur in Michigan would not be good for camouflage. But having white fur at the North Pole means they can blend in with the ice, so that is good camouflage. But as the North Pole is melting and there's no longer ice for polar bears to, to sit on and hide on, um, they, 
they're no longer going to be camouflaged. They're no longer going to have a place to hunt, and that's no longer going to be a good adaptation. So environments change, meaning adaptations that are good sometimes um, might be bad other times. A uh, little bit about just how long evolution is. Uh, Earth is 4.6 billion years ago, or billion years old. Life started 3.5 billion years ago. Multicellular life is fairly new. It, it happened about 0.5 billion years ago, 0.6 billion years ago, meaning the first three billion years of life on Earth was just um, prokaryotic creatures, um, small single-celled organisms, no plants, no animals, stuff way more simple than that. Mammals uh, are about 0.2 billion years old. Humans are about 0 0.0001 billion years old. Evolution is a very, very slow process. Um, if we think of the planet as a 24-hour clock, the Earth is formed at midnight, Life starts at 4 a.m. Um, sex doesn't evolve until 6 p.m. And uh, sex really sped up evolution because now you're, you're mixing traits uh, instead of just uh, reproducing through cloning. Um, you don't even have like simple organisms like seaweed or jellyfish till 8 p.m. The first plants on land are at 10 p.m. Dinosaurs don't show up until 11 p.m. So again, if you think about dinosaurs as being so, so, so long ago, and it is, they were around 65 million years ago, but 65 million years is not that long when you compare how old the Earth is and how long life has been around. So dinosaurs uh, were here around 11, mammals at 11.40 p.m., and then humans didn't show up on Earth, didn't evolve until about 11.59. Um, it's pretty incredible to think about the impact we've had on Earth, the amount of, of, of um, destruction of planet Earth we've done, the, the, the amount of things that we've changed in nature, and we've only been on Earth for a minute uh, compared to 24 hours in this analogy. Okay, switching gears again, plate tectonics. Um, what are plate tectonics and how are they uh, relevant to evolution? So a plate is simply a portion of the Earth's crust, and tectonics um, is a geological term for movement. So basically, um, plates, or parts of the Earth's crust, move. And um, when they move, that creates landforms, and it also creates geologic events, like earthquakes and volcanoes. And I don't know why I'm swaying back and forth. That's probably uh, distracting to you. Um, so, for example, when plate tectonics, when plates crash into each other, that forms mountains, and those mountains can be ge geologic barriers leading to evolution. When plates separate, that can cause a valley. That valley can become an ocean or a lake, another um, isolation event. And then things like earthquakes and volcanoes um, can lead to extinctions, and extinctions are going to lead to new opportunities for other creatures to fill niches. Um, here's a map of our different um, tectonic plates. Um, it's interesting to note that the borders between plates are often where we find the most volcanoes and the most earthquakes. So think about the U.S. Where do most of our earthquakes happen? California. Look at the map. We see the Pacific plate and the North American plate um, meet in California. So anytime one of those plates uh, moves or rubs against each other, um, that's why California has tons of earthquakes. Um, Along the western edge of the Pacific Plate, so like around here, um, that's the most volcanically active area on Earth um, because, again, you have um, multiple plates um, bumping into each other causing volcanoes. Uh, you don't need to know this, but plates can move in different ways. Push them together, that makes mountains. Move them apart, that creates a... a vast openness that can be filled with water. Sliding past each other causes earthquakes, um, and they can either build land or destroy land depending on how they're moving. Probably the most famous um, aspect of plate tectonics is Pangaea. Pangaea was the supercontinent where all, pretty much all of the Earth's mass was um, in one place. Pangaea broke up about 180 million years ago so these different continents um, sort of moved all around. They're not done moving. The present map that we have today is, is just where they are now. Um, generally, these, these continents are moving too slow for us to notice, but in geologic time, these, these uh, plates are absolutely still moving. Um, you can see 
we'll talk about Australia in a little bit. Australia ended up isolated, kind of in the middle of the ocean by itself, and that leads to the type of species that live in Australia. Um, notice India was its own landmass for a while, and then the Indian subcontinent crashed into the rest of Asia. Um, what happened there? The Himalayan mountains. The Himalayan mountains are the largest mountain range in the world um, because a huge continent um, crashed into another even bigger continent, and that led to convergent ta uh, plate tectonics. As I mentioned, these crazy creatures, uh, koala, capybara, uh, no, not a capybara, quora, Q-U-O-R-R-O, -R -R I'm blanking on this one. Maybe someone can look it up. Uh, but we've got a koala, a, uh, a wallaby, which is like a small kangaroo, a Tasmanian devil, a echidna, a tree kangaroo, and a duck-billed platypus. These animals are really weird. They're not found anywhere else on Earth. They're pretty much all marsupials, meaning they have a pouch where, they're off, where their uh, baby lives, or they're monotremes, meaning they're a egg-laying mammal. The two monotremes are the duck-billed platypus and the echidna. Um, why is it we, that we have these such bizarre creatures in Australia? Well, go back and look at that map on the previous slide. Australia has been isolated for a really, really long time. So um, there really hasn't been intermingling between Australian creatures and the rest of the world. And so because of that isolation, because of unique uh, environmental conditions, Australian creatures just end up really weird, really different. Um, so here's what you need to know about all this plate tectonic stuff. Plate tectonics are going to lead to new habitats and isolation. For example, a mountain, the Himalayan mountains, shows up out of nowhere because India crashed into Asia. Um, Australia floated out into the sea and is isolated. Um, and, and this new habitats, these new isolations, are going to lead to evolution. And evolution equals biodiversity. Because as things evolve, they become different from one another. The, the two species of rodent at the uh, Grand Canyon, plate tectonics causes the Grand Canyon. Well, that's a little different. A river caused the Grand Canyon. Two species turn into four species. Biodiversity just doubled. Um, so again, this right here is like the, the gist of what you need to know for um, plate tectonics. Um, land bridges. Um, these are uh, basically the opposite of isolation. But um, previously unconnected plates can um, connect and allow species to migrate. Um, the migration of species, um, kind of the opposite of isolation, can also lead to biodiversity because as species get to new places, um, they then will eventually evolve to fit that new environment. For example, camels, which originated in Asia, um, walked to North America across the um, Bering Strait land bridge, which is probably one of the most famous land bridges ever because that's how people got to North America. Um, Native Americans uh, um, and Native South Americans um, walked from Asia to North America, um, originally from Africa, where all people evolved. Um, and so camels um, uh, migrated to North America. That species of camel went extinct. Um, but other camels migrated down to South America, where it's more mountainous and is no longer beneficial to be big and, and large like an Asian camel, um, but that's where llamas and alpacas and guanacos and vicuñas, the small um, South American version of the camels, evolved. And so here you have, again, increase in biodiversity because of land bridges. All right, to summarize all this stuff, uh, tectonic plates move that creates barriers, oceans, rift valleys, um, and isolation events. Um, they, they, the movement of plates through different climate zones create new habitats. This allows for new adaptations. Adaptations leads to speciation. That leads to the incredible diversity of around 10 million species on planet Earth. Two million that we know about, around 10 million total, best guess. Um, you'll probably be asked to apply this stuff uh, at some point, so like knowing named examples of uh, plate tectonics and evolution and biodiversity. Here's a couple. Um, this probably isn't all you need to know. You probably need to do a little bit of research just to get some more information here. Um, Madagascar is isolated off the coast of Africa. 
So even though there's lots of different species of, of uh, primates, apes, and um, old world monkeys in Africa, um, lemurs are found in Madagascar and they're endemic to Madagascar. They're found nowhere else. There's a lot of really, really unique species in Madagascar because it's an island. The marsupials that I talked about that are only found in Australia, and then probably the original example uh, that Darwin discovered, those specific endemic species to the Galapagos. The Galapagos are 600 miles off the coast of South America. They're really isolated from any other large place. Um, notice that uh, islands are really important here because islands are almost always going to have high levels of endemic species, species that can't migrate and intermingle anywhere else, so they're going to be isolated and evolved to meet their specific um, uh, habitat needs. Um, and so uh, they're also going to be fairly vulnerable because um, if the forests of Madagascar get cut down for palm oil plantations, which they currently are, then lemurs go extinct and there's no backup plan because there's no other place that lemurs live besides Madagascar. Okay, the last part of this um, evolution subtopic is about extinctions, and this is going to lead into topic 3.3, which is um, how humans negatively impact biodiversity. Okay, so an extinction is when a species no longer exists, exists on Earth. Um, there are some similar terms here, and in terms of writing and using proper ESS terminology, um, it's good to know these. I'm probably never going to ask you a multiple choice question and say define extant, but um, if you can use the term extant in your writing, uh, it make, makes you sound better. So extant is the opposite of extinct. Um, you know, humans are extant. Neanderthals are extinct. Um, and then the other term is extirpated. When a species is extinct from a certain area, but not extinct from the earth, they are extirpated. Um, sorry, I'm thinking of an extirpated species. Uh, mountain lions are extirpated from Macomb County. Um, mountain lions used to live all over Michigan. They now live um, very rarely in like the northern uh, uh, upper peninsula or northern lower peninsula. It's usually a, a wandering male looking for a female, um, but they don't exist in Macomb County. Mountain lions aren't extinct, but they've been extirpated from our area. 99% of all species to ever live on Earth are extinct. Um, everything goes extinct. Uh, the species that we have today are just the things that haven't gone extinct yet. A couple examples of human-caused extinctions, or better yet, anthropocentric, or I'm sorry, anthropogenic uh, extinctions. Um, that's a specific subspecies of pink river dolphin, the golden toad, the passenger pigeon, and the Tasmanian tiger. These have all gone extinct in the last hundred years because of us. So extinction is natural, again, because pretty much everything that's ever lived on Earth has gone extinct. Um, again, um, almost everything, 99% of anything that's ever lived is gone. It's not because of humans, it's because of natural events. Um, the, the natural rate of extinction is about one species per million per year. So um, assuming we have about 10 million species on Earth, Naturally, 10 species will go extinct about every year. Um, realize that the Earth has been around for billions of years, so that means that um, billions of species have gone extinct over time. Um, today, we're losing about 100 to 1,000 species per year, so we're at about 100 times the natural rate of extinction, um, and that's because of us, uh, probably not surprisingly, and we'll, we'll get into some of the details later on, especially in topic three. So even though things go extinct naturally at this slow, gradual pace, um, there's often events that cause mass extinctions. A mass extinction is when um, over half of the species on Earth go extinct at one time. Um, and that's usually because of some dramatic event, such as uh, uh, climate change, a volcano, a volcano, an asteroid. There's been five mass extinctions since life started. Um, you've probably all heard of the fifth one. That's when the, the dinosaurs went extinct, and that sort of um, paved the way for mammals to become the large dominant species. Um, maybe you haven't heard of the first four, um, but we can see throughout history um, that this background rate of extinction, meaning you know things are, are slowly going extinct, new species are evolving, old species going extinct, new species are evolving, old species going extinct. 
Um, but then you have these spikes. And these spikes are usually because a volcano erupts and it blocks out the sun for two years and uh, the temperature of the earth drops by 20 degrees. And again, this isn't like a volcano erupts like the stuff we see on the news once in a while. This is like something that happens once every 500 million years. Um, or uh, an asteroid um, hits the planet and, and that's what killed the dinosaurs. So something major happened that causes these extinctions. Uh, we're going to go into these in more detail um, later on, but we have the first mass extinction. The second one, this one caused 95% of all ocean species to, to disappear. Um, and then here's the most famous one, um, when pretty much when all the dinosaurs and most other animals went extinct, um, probably because of an asteroid. Uh, can't be proven, but there's a um, crater in Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula, that is um, about 65 million years old, and it is likely where the asteroid uh, hit that wiped out the dinosaurs. But here's what's kind of cool about mass extinctions. After an extinction event, you have a lot of niche opportunities. So think about it. An asteroid hits the Earth and it kills all the dinosaurs. Those dinosaurs were eating a ton of food and, and held um, really important niches in the ecosystem. But now those niches are, are open and mammals at the time were these small, tiny, underground dwelling animals. Um, and they were able to evolve and basically take over those niches. Um, you get rapid evolution here. So you get really, really fast speciation. Um, uh, one of my favorite evolutionary biologists, Stephen Jay Gould, um, who wrote a lot of really cool books. One of them is called The Flamingo Smile, which was great. Um, he coined the term punctuated equilibrium, which is the idea that um, evolution is not this slow, steady process. Uh, yes, it's a slow process, but it sort of ebbs and flows where evolution may happen at a really slow pace, but then all of a sudden a bunch of species go extinct and that allows evolution to happen at a really, really fast pace. Um, and then things slow down for a bit, and then there's an extinction event, and then a huge speciation event. Um, think of the stock market. So, as you know, the stock market slowly goes up over time, but if you look more detailed, there's these different crashes. And so the thing to realize is, when's the best time to invest in the stock market? Um, right after a crash, because that's when there's the most opportunity for growth. Uh, when's the best time for, for, for creatures to evolve right after an extinction event. Because if you're one of the lucky organisms that survives an extinction event, a mass extinction, there's now all this niche opportunity, um, all these resources for fast, rapid speciation. Um, we see the balance here between speciation and extinction. Generally, um, generally it's, it's even. Um, if, 100 species went extinct this year, 100 species are going to evolve. But um, again, it changes. During mass extinctions, there's way more extinctions than speciations. After a mass extinction, there's more species being formed um, and less extinction. Uh, however, and let's end on a, uh, a somber note, um, five mass extinctions throughout history. Most scientists agree that we have officially started the sixth mass extinction. This is called the Anthropocene extinction, um, meaning anthro, humans. This is the human-caused extinction. Uh, this is obviously unique from the other five because the other five were natural. The other five were, were because of asteroids and uh, volcanoes and uh, major climate changes. Um, this one's because of humans. This is because of humans um, destroying the planet. Um, how are we causing this sixth extinction? Um, Take a second to brainstorm. Try to come up with, um, I don't know, at least half, at least three or four. But um, next topic, 3.3, which is on human threats to biodiversity, um, let's talk about how we are causing this sixth mass extinction in six different ways. Um, okay, that's it for uh, 3.2, evolution. And this is a, a, a lead-in to 3.3. So brainstorm this uh, next top, this uh, last question. Hopefully you guys wrote down questions throughout the lecture and we can recap in class. Bye.